Chapter forty of David Copperfield. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tig Hines. David Copperfield by Charles Dickens. Chapter forty. The Wanderer. We had a very serious conversation in Buckingham Street that night about the domestic occurrences I have detailed in the last chapter. My aunt was deeply interested in them, and walked up and down the room with her arms folded for more than two hours afterwards. Whenever she was particularly discomposed, she always performed one of these pedestrian feats, and the amount of her discomposure might be always estimated by the duration of her walk. On this occasion she was so much disturbed in mind as to find it necessary to open the bedroom door, and make a course for herself comprising the full extent of the bedrooms from wall to wall and while mr dick and i sat quietly by the fire she kept passing in and out along this measured track at an unchanging pace with the regularity of a clock pendulum when my aunt and i were left to ourselves by mr dick's going out to bed i sat down to write my letter to the two old ladies by that time she was tired of walking and sat by the fire with her dress tucked up as usual but instead of sitting in her usual manner holding her glass upon her knee she suffered it to stand neglected upon the chimney-piece and, resting her left elbow on her right arm, and her chin on her left hand, looked thoughtfully at me. As often as I raised my eyes from what I was about, I met hers. "'I am in the lovingest of tempers, my dear,' she would assure me with a nod, "'but I am fidgeted and sorry.' I had been too busy to observe until after she was gone to bed that she had left her night-mixture, as she always called it, untasted on the chimney-piece. She came to her door with even more than her usual affection of manner when I knocked to acquaint her with this discovery, but only said, I have not the heart to take a trot to-night, and shook her head and went in again. She read my letter to the two old ladies in the morning and approved of it. I posted it and had nothing to do then but wait as patiently as I could for the reply. I was still in this state of expectation and had been for nearly a week when I left the doctor's one snowy night to walk home. It had been a bitter day, and a cutting northeast wind had blown for some time. The wind had gone down with the light, and so the snow had come on. It was a heavy settled fall, I recollect, in great flakes, and it lay thick. The noise of wheels and tread of people were as hushed as if the streets had been strewn that depth with feathers. My shortest way home, and I naturally took the shortest way on such a night, was through St. Martin's Lane. Now the church which gives its name to the lane stood in a less free situation at that time, there being no open space before it, and the lane winding down to the strand. As I passed the steps of the portico I encountered, at the corner, a woman's face. It looked into mine, and passed across the narrow lane and disappeared. I knew it, I had seen it somewhere, but I could not remember where. I had some association with it that struck upon my heart directly but i was thinking of anything else when it came upon me and was confused on the steps of the church there was the stooping figure of a man who had put down some burden on the smooth snow to adjust it my seeing the face and my seeing him were simultaneous i don't think i had stopped in my surprise but in any case as i went on he rose turned and came down towards me i stood face to face with mr peggotty then i remembered the woman it was Martha, to whom Emily had given the money that night in the kitchen, Martha Endell, side by side with whom he would not have seen his dear niece, Ham had told me, for all the treasures wrecked in the sea. We shook hands heartily. At first neither of us could speak a word. "'Master Davy,' he said, gripping me tight, "'it do my heart good to see you, sir. Well met, well met.' "'Well met, my dear old friend,' said I. I had my thoughts of coming down to make inquiration for you, sir, to-night, he said, but knowing as your aunt was living along with you, for I'd been down yonder, Yarmouth way, I was afeard it was too late. I should have come early in the morning, sir, afore going away. Again, said I. Yes, sir, he replied, patiently shaking his head. I'm away to-morrow. And where are you going now? I asked. Well, he replied, shaking the snow out of his long hair, I was a-going to turn in somewheres. In those days there was a side entrance to the stable-yard of the Golden Cross, the inn so memorable to me in connection with his misfortune, nearly opposite to where we stood. I pointed out the gateway, put my arm through his, and we went across. Two or three public rooms opened out of the stable-yard, and looking into one of them, and finding it empty and a good fire burning, I took him in there. 
when i saw him in the light i observed not only that his hair was long and ragged but that his face was burnt dark by the sun it was greyer the lines in his face and forehead were deeper and he had every appearance of having toiled and wandered through all varieties of weather but he looked very strong and like a man upheld by steadfastness of purpose whom nothing could tire out he shook the snow from his hat and clothes and brushed it away from his face while i was inwardly making these remarks as he sat down opposite to me at the table with his back to the door by which we had entered he put out his rough hand again and grasped mine warmly i tell you master davy he said where all i've been and what all we've heard i've been fur and we've heard little but i'll tell you i rang the bell for something hot to drink he would have nothing stronger than ale and while it was being brought and being warmed at the fire he sat thinking there was a fine massive gravity in his face i did not venture to disturb when she was a child he said lifting up his head soon after we were left alone she used to talk to me a deal about the sea and about them coasts where the sea got to be dark blue and to lay a shining and a shining in the sun i thought odd times as our father being drownded made her think on it so much i don't know you see but maybe she believed or hoped he had drifted out to them parts where the flowers is always a blowing and the country bright it is likely to have been a childish fancy i replied when she was lost said mr peggotty i knowed in my mind as he would take her to them countries i knowed in my mind as he'd have told her wonders of them and how she was to be a lady there and how he'd got her to listen to him first along as such like when we see his mother i knowed quite as well as i was right i went across channel to france and landed there as if i fell down from the sky i saw the door move and the snow drift in i saw it move a little more and a hand softly interposed to keep it open i found out an english gentleman as was in authority said mr peggotty and told him i was a-going to see my niece he got me them papers as i wanted for to carry me through i do not rightly know how they're called and he would have give me money but that i was thankful to have no need on i thank him kind after all he done i'm sure i wrote it for you he says to me and i shall speak to many as will come that way and many will know you far distant from here when you're a-travelling alone i told him best as i was able what my gratitude was and went away through france alone and on foot said i mostly afoot he rejoined sometimes in carts along a people going to market sometimes in empty coaches many mile a day afoot and often with some poor soldier or another travelling to see his friends i couldn't talk to him said mr peggotty nor him to me but we was company for one another too along the dusty roads i should have known that by his friendly tone when i come to any town he pursued i found the inn and waited about the yard till someone turned up someone mostly did as knowed english then i told them that i was on my way to seek my niece and they told me what manner of gentlefolks was in the house and i waited to see annie as seemed like her going in or out when it weren't emily i went on again by little and little when i came to a new village or that among the poor people i found they'd knowed about me they would set me down at their cottage doors and give me what not for to eat and drink and show me where to sleep and many a woman master davy as has had a daughter of about emily's age i found a waiting for me at our saviour's cross outside the village for to do me similar kindnesses some has had daughters as was dead and god only knows how good them mothers was to me it was martha at the door i saw her haggard listening face distinctly my dread was lest he should turn his head and see her too they would often put their children particularly their little girls said mr peggotty upon my knee and many a time you might have seen me sitting at their doors when night was coming in almost as if they'd been my darling's children oh my darling overpowered by a sudden grief he sobbed aloud i laid my trembling hand upon the hand he put before his face thank ye sir he said do and take no notice in a very little while he took his hand away and put it on his breast and went on with his story they often walked with me he said in the morning maybe a mile or two upon the road and when we parted and i said i'm very thankful to you god bless you they always seemed to understand and answered pleasant at last i came to the sea 
It weren't hard, you may suppose, for a seafarer man like me to work his way over to Italy. When I got there, I wandered on as I had done before, and people was just as good to me, and I should have gone from town to town, maybe the country through, but that I got news of her being seen among them Swiss mountains yonder. One has noticed servants see them there, all three, and told me how they travelled and where they was. I made for them mountains, Master Davy, day and night. Ever so far I went, ever so far the mountains seemed to shift away from me. But I came up with them and crossed them, and when I got nigh the place as I had been told of, I began to think within my own self, what shall I do when I see her? The listening face, insensible to the inclement night, still drooped at the door, and the hands begged me, prayed me, not to cast it forth. "'I never doubted her,' said Mr. Peggotty. "'No, not a bit. Only let her see my face, only let her hear my voice, only let my standing still afore her bring to her thoughts the home she had fled away from, and the child she had been, and if she had grown to be a royal lady, she'd have fell down at my feet. I knowed it well.' Many a time in my sleep I had heard her cry out, Uncle, and seen her fall like death afore me. Many a time in my sleep I had raised her up and whispered to her, Emily, my dear, I am come for to bring forgiveness and to take you home. He stopped and shook his head and went on with a sigh. He was now to me now. Emily was all. I bought a country dress to put upon her, and I know that once found she would walk beside me over them stony roads, go where I would, and never, never leave me more. To put that dress upon her, and to cast off what she wore, to take her on my arm again and wander towards home, to stop sometimes upon the road and heal her bruised feet and her worst bruised heart, was all that I thought of now. I don't believe I should have done so much as to look at him. But, Master Davy, it weren't to be, not yet. I was too late, and they were gone. Where, I couldn't learn. Some said here, some said there. I travelled here, and I travelled there, but I found no Emily, and I travelled home. How long ago? I asked. A matter of four days, said Mr. Peggotty. I sighted the old boat after dark, and the light a-shining in the window. When I came nigh and looked in through the glass, I see the faithful creature, Mrs. Gummidge, sitting by the fire, as we had fixed upon, alone. I called out, Don't be afeard, it's Dan'l, and I went in. I never could have thought the old boat could have been so strange. From some pocket in his breast he took out with a very careful hand a small paper bundle containing two or three letters or little packets, which he laid upon the table. This fuss done come, he said, selecting it from the rest, afore I had been gone a week. A fifty-pound banknote and a sheet of paper directed to me, and put underneath the door in the night. She tried to hide her writing, but she couldn't hide it from me. He folded up the note again with great patience and care, in exactly the same form, and laid it on one side. This came to Mrs. Gummidge, he said, opening another, two or three months ago. After looking at it for some moments, he gave it to me, and added in a low voice, Be so good as read it, sir. I read as follows. Oh, what you will feel when you see this writing, and know it comes from my wicked hand. But try, try, not for my sake, but for uncle's goodness. Try to let your heart soften to me only for a little, little time. Try, pray do, to relent towards a miserable girl, and write down on a bit of paper whether he is well, and what he said about me before you left off ever naming me among yourselves, and whether of a night, when it is my old time of coming home, you ever see him look as if he thought of one he used to love so dear. Oh, my heart is breaking when I think about it. I am kneeling down to you, begging and praying you not to be as hard with me as I deserve, as I well, well know I deserve, but to be so gentle and so good as to write down something of him and to send it to me. You need not call me little, and you need not call me by the name I have disgraced, but, oh, listen to my agony, and have mercy on me so far as to write some word of uncle, never, never to be seen in this world by my eyes again. Dear, if your heart is hard towards me, justly hard, I know, but listen, if it is hard, dear, ask him I have wronged the most, him whose wife I was to have been, before you quite decide against my poor, poor prayer. If he should be so compassionate as to say that you might write something for me to read, I think he would, oh, I think he would, if you would only ask him, for he always was so brave and so forgiving. Tell him then, but not else, that when I hear the wind blowing at night, I feel as if it was passing angrily from seeing him and uncle, and was going up to God against me. 
tell him that if i was to die to-morrow and oh if i was fit i would be so glad to die i would bless him and uncle with my last words and pray for his happy home with my last breath some money was enclosed in this letter also five pounds it was untouched like the previous sum and he refolded it in the same way detailed instructions were added relative to the address of a reply which though they betrayed the intervention of several hands and made it difficult to arrive at any very probable conclusion in reference to her place of concealment made it at least not unlikely that she had written from that spot where she was stated to have been seen what answer was sent i inquired of mr peggotty mrs gummidge he returned not being a good scholar sir ham kindly drawed it out and she made a copy on it they told her i was gone to seek her and what my parting words was is that another letter in your hand said i it's money sir said mr peggotty unfolding it a little way ten pound you see and wrote inside from a true friend like the first but the first was put underneath the door and this come by the post day afore yesterday i'm a going to seek her at the postmark he showed it to me it was a town on the upper rhine he had found out at yarmouth some foreign dealers who knew that country and they had drawn him a rude map on paper which he could very well understand he laid it between us on the table and with his chin resting on one hand tracked his course upon it with the other i asked him how ham was he shook his head he works he said as bold as a man can his name's as good in all them parts as any man's is anywheres in the world anyone's hand is ready to help him you understand and his is ready to help them he's never been heard for to complain but my sister's belief is twixt ourselves as it has cut him deep poor fellow i can believe it he ain't no care master davy said mr peggotty in a solemn whisper kinder no care nohow for his life when a man's wanted for rough service in rough weather he's there and when there's hard duty to be done with danger in it he steps forward to fall all his mates and yet he's as gentle as any child there ain't a child in yarmouth that doant know him he gathered up the letters thoughtfully smoothing them with his hand put them into their little bundle and placed it tenderly in his breast again the face was gone from the door i still saw the snow drifting in but nothing else was there well he said looking into his bag I haven't seen you to-night master davy and that does me good i shall away be times to-morrow morning you've seen what i've got here putting his hand on where the little packet lay all that troubles me is to think that any harm might come to me afore that money was give back if i was to die and if it was lost or stole or elseways made away with and it was never known by him but what i took it i believe t'other world wouldn't hold me i believe i must come back he rose and i rose too we grasped each other by the hand again before going out i'd go ten thousand mile he said i'd go till i drop dead to lay that money down afore him if i do that and find my emily i'm content if i do and find her maybe she'll come to hear some time as her loving uncle only ended his search for her when he ended his life and if i know her even that'll turn her home at last as he went out into the rigorous night i saw the lonely figure flit away before us i turned him hastily on some pretence and held him in conversation until it was gone he spoke of a traveller's house on the dover road where he knew he could find a clean plain lodging for the night i went with him over westminster bridge and parted from him on the surrey shore everything seemed to my imagination to be hushed in reverence for him as he resumed his solitary journey through the snow I returned to the inn-yard, and, impressed by my remembrance of the face, looked awfully around for it. It was not there. The snow had covered our late footprints. My new track was the only one to be seen. And even that began to die away. It snowed so fast, as I looked back over my shoulder. End of